Hey everybody, welcome to Heifer USA's Great American Farm Tour. So excited for this video today. We have a really awesome schedule lined up for you. Uh, my name is Tyler Pearson, Program Officer with Heifer USA, and I'm joined today by Mr. John Arbuckle, the head farmer here at Singing Pastures Farm. We're at the largest pig farm in the state of Maine. We're going to be showcasing some really cool stuff, having some great conversations in this video, all about raising pigs on pasture and really getting into the ecological impacts of raising raising pigs, how to improve your land, how to grow your business. We're going to be talking about crunching numbers, the importance of managing your business well, and so much more. It's going to be a really awesome video. I hope you stick around for it. You're going to learn a ton. I've been talking to John just for a few minutes this morning and I've already learned so much and it's just beautiful out here. It's July in Maine. It doesn't get any better than this. Uh, stick around, check it out. We got so much to cover. Um, if you are watching the live broadcast, just type your questions in the live chat and we will answer as many of those as we can. And if you're watching the recorded version of the video, please just type your questions in the comments and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're new here, if this is your first time seeing a Great American Farm Tour video with Heifer USA, we've got lots more on the channel, so many production videos you'd love to see, and a lot more regenerative agriculture related content. So I'm going to turn it over to John, get the conversation and the tour started today. John, how are you this morning? I'm great. Uh, thanks so much, Tyler, for being out here. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's really beautiful. You have a beautiful uh, farm. And I'm really excited to jump into the content today. I know you're really passionate about raising pigs, about improving your land, about uh, f you know running a business as a farmer. And I think you have a lot of knowledge and wisdom that I can't wait to get into to share with our audience today. Well, I, I hope to learn from your audience also. Absolutely. We'll be uh, a asking questions from the live audience. And so feel free to give us feedback, you guys. I want to say hi real quick to Toy Andrews watching from Charlottesville at UVA Camp. Campus. Hey to Andrew Phillips, Angela Clark watching in Nambia, West Africa, Sehu Daltu watching from Nigeria, so many of you guys from all over the world. Good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are, thanks for joining us. Um, so John, I know that kind of jumping into things, you wanted to show the pastures just right away because as you mentioned to me earlier, you grow grass and that's a huge part of what you do here. Uh, do you want to go check out one of your pastures? Absolutely. Okay. Let's go see one that we've just recently grazed with about a hundred sheep. Uh, it's just down here. And uh, I really like to think that grazing in a regenerative sense is, in a nutshell, I define that as simply giving to the land more than we take from the land. So what we see when we graze our pastures is after each grazing event, we want the pastures to come back more resilient, you know, healthier, stronger than they were before. And there's a couple of ways we measure that. One of them is quantitatively with the amount of biomass produced and the species diversity that it, uh, of forage that it hosts. Here's a good spot. And I'll just walk in front of you here. So, uh, I started to talk about we, there's a quantitative way that we major, uh, that we measure uh, the resiliency of our land, but there's also a qualitative measure. And the qualitative measure is what we don't track with analytical metrics, but it's these little Easter eggs that we keep finding. For example, this big like, field out here in front of me, it's about 60 acres. And we were told last summer that we have one of the largest ground nesting songbird populations in the entire state of Maine. That's the qualitative, that's the quality part. You know, we, we find these little things that I call Easter eggs. They're kind of happy surprises that we didn't expect. But um, as a result of the land improving, the grassland getting to be more and more you know, flood resistant, drought resistant, more species diversity of forage. As a result of all those improvements, now we have one of the biggest uh, populations of bobolinks and savanna sparrows in our state. That's awesome. And you do this raising pigs primarily, right? Yeah, exactly. And everything that you can see and a lot more that you can't gets grazed uh, every year with mm -hmm. our pigs. You know, that's really incredible. When, when most people, I think, think of a pig farm, 
They don't think of lush green pastures everywhere, but that's exactly what you have out here. I mean, it is just popping. Yeah, and it gets lusher and greener the longer we, the longer we continue using our planned holistic grazing map. And so th this paddock here, mm -hmm. um, you said you have, you've, you've also do some sheep, right? Yes, yes, we've got about 100 lamb on the farm. And for full transparency, I don't own the lamb. Mm -hmm. um, when we started farming, uh, we were incubated. You know, there was a farm that was an incubator farm that helped us to have a soft landing into our start, you know, of farming. And now that we're a more established farm, we're trying to kind of pay that forward and other farmers in our area who want to participate in regenerative grazing, we just try to make that a soft landing for them. Very nice. And how long have you been managing the land here? Uh, we moved to Maine six, this is our sixth summer here. Wow, awesome. Yep. Yeah. And, and over, over those six years, what kind of transformations have you seen on this, on this property? Well, there are still, for, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but there's a, a little stand of Canada thistle right there. Yep, just right there a little bit, yeah. And it, it used to be that some of these fields were nothing but Canada thistle. Mm -hmm. I mean, solid, can, I mean, no, not like any grass kind of thing. And you know, there's, this is one of the mindsets that are correlated with regenerative agriculture, is you don't wake up every day thinking, what pest am I gonna kill? You know what I mean? That's, that's the mindset um, that we try to not have. You know, the mindset that we do really try to go for is how can I nurture the overall resiliency of the entire system so that the more palatable and nutritious grasses that I want will simply outcompete the stuff that I don't want. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a big shift. That's a, that's a really, really, really big course correct th that I like to share with farmers. Um, that's the biggest change, is some of these fields were solid Canada thistle. Um, we still have a very small drainage issue in a few places, but the drainage issue, you know, the water, the water is, going, you know, is no longer standing the way it used to. Mm -hmm. And more than anything, uh, the hillside in front of us um, used to be a very lunar or Martian landscape. You know, when I, when I first got here, it, um, it looked like pictures, you know, of the desert and, and during a drought. You know, it was like cracked blocks of mud with uh, stunted, poisonous kind of horse nettle, mm -hmm. you know, growing about six inches high in between. It, it seriously looked like something out of the apocalypse. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the great things, you know, about regenerative agriculture is it doesn't take a thousand years to fix, you know, degraded soil. I've been here for six years and we started seeing enormous, enormous improvements at just after 18 months of, you know, following regenerative practices here. That's incredible. Yeah, 18 months. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take forever. Awesome. And, and um, I want to ask you a little bit about your practices and principles and about your uh, kind of schedule and rotation and everything. Yeah. Uh, just jump in real quick, though, and let you guys know that we got some of the things that we're going to cover in this video. Um, we're talking about ecological health and improvements of the land. Um, you know, Singing Pastures does a, does a lot of pork related products. They raise a lot of pigs here. They farrow a lot of pigs here, although this is your last season farrowing. So we came just in time so we can still see some of the infrastructure and equipment and maybe ask a few questions about farrowing, which is something I know a lot of you are interested in that we don't get a lot of time to talk about on our channel. Uh, so we're going to cover some farrowing stuff over here, walk by some barns, walk to some other pastures, um, and have lots of great conversation about ecological improvements, raising pigs, and making money along the way. So if you have questions, just type them in the live chat or in the comments down below and be a part of the conversation with us. We'd love to hear from you guys. Um, all right, cool. So yeah, uh, what else do you want to say about uh, this pasture here? Maybe um, anything about your practices or... Yeah, just it's it's sometimes it's worth knowing that um, regenerative grazing does not yield a pasture that looks like a golf course. You know what I mean? Like we go for 60% um, consumed 
and then 20% trampled and maybe 20% still left standing. Of the forage. Of the forage that's there, of the, the, the grass and the forbs and the legumes that are there. That's, that's kind of what we shoot for because we're, we're balancing land performance with animal performance. You know, we want the animals to be gaining weight uh, at a predictable rate, and we want the land to be improving at the same time. If we were just going for one or the other, we would get out of balance in the long term. You know, but that's, that's something we really strive for, is we try to never sacrifice the long term in favor of the short term. Yeah. So, yeah, balancing animal health and land health kind of gets you something that looks like this. Well, it looks pretty great. You know, there, there's, it, yeah, it's, it's, kind, it's pretty, it's also just a little bit ragged, you know, and that a lot's been trampled, a lot's been left standing, and a lot's been grazed. Awesome. And ladies and gentlemen, Woo! this is my son, Noah. Hey, Noah. Hello. Noah's my right-hand man around here. Um, whenever I'm at my desk trying to figure out, you know, the next priority or the next, you know, business-related thing to do, I, I know I can count on Noah to be taking care of the animals and stringing fence and driving the tractor and cleaning out barns and moving hay bales around. And While you're uh, spending time on camera with folks like me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> the tractor, um, the pin that goes for the forks just broke. Oh, it, okay. Did, and, but you Troubleshoot the, problems. We'll fix that yeah. later, but that's I okay. I have the, like, the hay bale got into space. Okay, great. That is in the right spot. Would you like awesome. me to start unrolling that? Um, yeah, my, yeah, you could do that. Thanks, okay. Noah. Thank you. Don't unroll the whole thing, because I'd like to show the crowd what we're doing. When you get when you get the sum of it done, Noah, go feed the go feed the bre the old breeding sows, please. Yes, please. So Noah's, Noah's going to demonstrate some chores for the audience. Yeah, a little bit. But what he's going to do right now is you don't end up with 100% vegetative cover after pigs without. Um, a couple of band-aids, mm -hmm. you know, so let's go look at this next hillside and then we'll make our way down and see what he's doing. Okay. So where I was going with that is our goal is to have 100% vegetative cover post graze. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see any dirt. And that's kind of like, you know, Euclid's perfect circle. It doesn't really exist, mm -hmm. you know, in nature. Um, so we get a little bit of soil disruption inevitably, like it rained four inches the other day, mm -hmm. you know, and pigs on pasture, you raise, you know, rains four inches, you're not gonna have 100% vegetative cover. So you can see here, can you see the line where the fence was? Yes, yeah, right down here, I'm guessing. Yep, that's curving, exactly right. Curving all the way. Where the grass is really tall and it looks weedy, there was a little, triangle there that the sheep didn't graze and the pigs didn't graze. Okay, so we got a really good example here of grazed land over here, ungrazed land right here, right? Exactly, and this is what Joel Salatin calls hitting the reset button. You know, so you don't want to graze grass when it's a baby, and you don't want to wait, it's like this grass here with all these seed heads, it's starting to turn brown. This is what, you know, Joel Salatin would call geriatric grass or like older grass. Mm -hmm. This is not ideal grazing, but if we can keep hitting the reset button, if we imagine that the grass that's out there right now has been successfully reset, it started to approach um, the end of its life cycle by creating seed heads, and it was grazed. Mm -hmm. So we hit the reset button, it reduced it to a very young grass, mm -hmm. and why that's important is uh, the photosynthetic process breathes carbon dioxide out of the air. So here is a leaf of grass, of course. That's the face of the grass that aims towards the sun. The underside of the grass is gonna have 300 stomata per square millimeter. And the stomata is a little mouth that breathes in carbon dioxide, allows that to go through the process of photosynthesis, and then releases oxygen. Now, when the plant inhales that carbon dioxide, it mixes it with water. So CO2 plus H2O runs through the photosynthetic process and what's created. What's created is one gigantic molecule of sugar, which the plant 
forces to the leaf tip and that fuels the plant's growth process. A lot of it goes there, but an even greater quantity tr of that liquid sugar, that giant molecule of sugar, trickles out. It drips out of the roots into the soil, liquid carbon going out of the atmosphere and back into the soil, eventually in a kind of oversimplified process, mm -hmm. forming organic matter and feeding the microbiome, the microscopic organisms in the soil that are really doing the heavy lifting. Yep. So why is it important to reset the grass? Is because this tall grass right here that's moving towards the end of its life cycle mm -hmm. is no longer respirating. It's mm -hmm. no longer breathing in the carbon dioxide as fast as the grass that we have reset. Right. So if we never reset the grass, we get really good respiration of the leaves until about June 1st. And then it stops. It's not hardly doing, it's not doing enough of it to matter anymore. Where if I want to continuously build my soil with carbon that right now is above me, and I don't want it to be above me, I want to capture it mm -hmm. in a biological process that stuffs it back into the ground where it belongs and eventually forms organic matter, mm -hmm. then if I can successfully keep hitting the reset button, I can keep that process going all summer. I get three, four, five, six cycles. Because it's that process of photosynthesis with the new plant growth that really is doing that, like you described, right? Got to be that. It's not, if the plant is brown, yeah. it's not photosynthesizing. And I've heard it described that, that uh, you know, grasslands, they, can't, they, they don't prune themselves like a tree does, mm -hmm. right? And so having herbivores and things to, keep the, to trim the grass down and allow for even more growth Mm -hmm. is going to help that process along even faster. Is that part of it? Absolutely. The land needs animals as much as flowers need bees. Mm -hmm. It can't go without it. Part of the ecosystem. The ecosystem. I'm not familiar with any grassland ecosystem that evolved without the evolutionary pressure of a large grazing mammal. Yeah. They all have them. They have to have them. And I'm going to get a little closer here and just okay. kind of show folks. And now, are, are you you're seeding this? No, no. Okay. The, the soil has the seed bank already in it. Uh huh. So okay, from from what they forage, because you're waiting until these go to basically seed, and close then to it. is that right? And then the, are the animals basically spreading it out? No, uh, there's a seed bank in the soil, and that's a process I don't understand completely. Mm -hmm. But I actually graze this a little bit before it goes to full seed, and. It's, the seed bank's just in there, whether it's in the roots or actual seeds or something, but we can... That's we, great, though, that you don't have to plant it and it just, you know, you're getting just the good forage looking, it looks oh, it's like. Inc it's incredible. This Every time I, gr I pulse graze this, mm -hmm. it comes back a little bit better. That's awesome. This is so fascinating. I think you have just such great visual examples of this process, too, and you say it very eloquently. It's really nice to see up close and personal. I can show you up here. Um, I talked a minute ago about how we got a four inch rainstorm the other day. You see a little bit of bare soil here yep. that we've started to cover up and we'll wander around to where my son is. Right, now are these uh, like rice holes or what is it? That um, you... Yeah, this is uh, brewer's grain. Brewer's grain, yeah. From a, from a beer place. And we you're just doing that to cover the soil basically? Yeah, the soil, if you can see dirt, you've wounded the soil. You know, so I have wounded my ecosystem with that big rainstorm and the number of giant pigs that I had out here. Bearing in mind that this is a wound that can heal. Mm -hmm. And the way that we speed up the healing process is to put a bandage on it. I got you. And nice. the way that we put a bandage on it is with old rotten bales of hay. Yeah. So we've spread one here and we're going to take you up here and we'll see um, the next one. Can you, can you see how much hay we've spread here? Mm-hmm. So this was the worst part of the wound. That's a, that's a wallow, yeah. which we're not going to cover up. We, we kind of want the wallow to stay because the pigs... Because you'll have pigs back here later on. Yeah, and they're very comfortable. If, if it's hot and they can get themselves muddy, that's like their favorite thing. But that doesn't mean that we need to allow the wallow to expand for the wound to get bigger. You know, so everything that's been tracked up and denuded is going to get covered with hay. 
And this time next year, it'll look great again. I see you got some pigs over there. Yeah. Some big old pigs. Yeah, big girls. Very nice. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and and is this? Would you call this hay bombing? Is that the term, well, technical if term? If I were or? hay bombing, I would put round bales in a field in a non-biologically active season, and then allow cows to graze it, and then they would um, cycle. They would help the earth break down the the high fiber mm -hmm. and then they would poop it all back out. That's kind of what I think hay bombing is. This is just hay band-aiding. Yeah, this is this is mulching. <laughs> this is sheet mulching. Great. Yeah. Very beautiful. Now, would you like to see one of our farrowing hutches or would you like since we're right next to it, or would you like to walk around and see our next hay bale bandaging effort? Let's take a look at the farrowing hut. Like I said, we don't we don't get a lot of talk about farrowing. Um, if you guys in the audience have any questions about ecological impacts or health of raising pigs out on pasture, uh, let us know in the chat. We'd be happy to field some of those. Questions about farrowing as well. We're going to, uh, we'll see some pigs over here in a little bit and going to get into the business side of thing, which is a really fascinating part of this conversation, you guys. Um, I, we haven't covered it yet, but John is doing, you know, raising over 900 pigs himself. But that's not even the real linchpin of his farm operation. Uh, he has a large um, value-added product line, Rome Snack Sticks. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's and, exactly right. And we're going to get into that as well a little bit later in the video and talk about how John has leveraged his farm here to create an even larger business opportunity that um, really drives you know what they're doing. And it's a really fascinating part of the story. But first, Fairwing Hut. Yeah, so. This is an insulated farrowing hut, which was manufactured in England. And it's steel, it's double wall steel with um, insulation all the way around it. So we, when we had 55 sows, we have a few less now, but we would put these things side by side all the way down right here. And we would circle the whole thing up with electric fence. And then what was important was in the past we tried to put these things on pasture and uh, it just, that worked great when the ground was frozen because uh, we filled them with bedding. I mean lots of bedding, like 24 inches of bedding, super mm -hmm. lots of bedding. That worked great when the ground was frozen, but in the springtime when we'd go through the frost heave and the ground would start to thaw, um, it would just become a quagmire. It would be, makes, I made such a mess one year. But uh, that's how you learn. Um, and uh, now we would put them on this cement pad and as we discovered some i wondered for a little while if the cement would um conduct electricity mm. because if we cycle if we run the electric fence all around it then the way it works is the pig touches the electric fence and then the positive goes into the pig or the negative goes out its foot I, i'm probably saying that wrong but Anyway, whatever it's standing on has to be some sort of a conductor. It turns out cement is a conductor, so mm -hmm. the idea worked. Okay, great. So they don't get, a, or it, it works because Because what? they would get electrocuted yes. if they touched right. the Right, they're not, they're not grounded. They're not from, grounded out. If they were standing on a rubber mat or it wouldn't work. something like gotcha. that, maybe it wouldn't work. But. Yeah. And, and how many of these did you say you typically run when you're farrowing? Um, 35, uh -huh. 40, I think I've got 35 or 40 of these. And, and typically about how many piglets would you, um, ray, you know, have a year? Um, I shoot for between nine and 10 weaned piglets per sow. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, that's what I shoot for. It seems like in reality, I'm, I'm getting about 950, uh, weaned piglets total in the span of a year. Wow. It's yeah. impressive. Wow. Yeah, most of them are born here. Mm -hmm. You can see there are more shade structures going farther back. Yep. We built those. And then there's more shade structures on this field. Um, if, uh, if we get some pigs that get out of cycle, like I really, really, really try for 80% of my farrowing each round to happen on the same week. Mm -hmm. So I'm usually going for like March 15th as my spring farrowing and then six months later as my fall farrowing. But inevitably, a couple of pigs get a little bit off, you know, in timing. In the summertime, if it, once it gets, starts to get hot, 
we don't really want to have this thing out in the sun. I mean, if we if I put my hand on it, right, it's hot enough that I don't really want to leave my hand on there for a long time. Yeah. And this would sort of be an inefficient solar cooker. So if you have a shelter for your mama pigs, it has to be in the shade. Even I'm in Maine, I'm in a relatively cool climate. It, it is required that this is in the shade mm -hmm. for a summer farrowing. Yeah. Or barring that, um, the structures that the open air structures that I have over there, if we get half a dozen sows that don't have their pigs on March, you know, 15th, but something goes wrong and they have them in June, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. I'll still make use of those piglets, but I'm going to make sure that the sow is as comfortable as I would want to be. Yeah. And that means that my rain structure can't be in the sun. We need, we, with very little airflow. Awesome. Um, quick question from our audience. Yes, sir. Nadra Williams uh, asked, and I think she's coming to the sh stream a little late, but just to re-clarify, how many acres is your farm here? Yeah. Um, she says your pastures are looking incredible looking, considering the number of pigs that you're raising. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate you saying that. And uh, I hope that they look more and more incredible the more pigs I raise. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what regenerative agriculture would be. And we're gonna see some of those pigs, right? Yeah, in just a minute, we'll go head right over. Great. Um, so how big is the place? It's a little bit under 200 acres. Great. Yeah, I don't think we actually covered that, Nadra. Thanks so much for asking it. Um, you guys feel free to jump in and be part of the conversation uh, with any questions that you have. Uh, I'm going to try not to interject too much because you are just a fountain of wisdom and I'm learning a ton. So thank <laughs> you for sharing. I don't know. <laughs> I no. like the sound of my own voice, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can watch this video on re replay as many times as yeah. you want. Cool. All right. Where, where, what, to, where, what do you think next? There's or... one addition that I like to share with people who okay. are interested in, in uh, farrowing. Mm -hmm. If you can see, it's very dark in there, but if you can see in there, can you see those metal pipes that we installed? Yes, I can, and I think folks on, on, uh, at home can. So we installed those metal pipes. And those are bumpers, those are barriers that would prevent crushing. So unfortunately, the baby pig's greatest danger is getting sat on uh, by its mother. And uh, those bumpers allow the piglets to get just outside of the danger zone. And it actually, you know, it's kind of a U shape. It's a little hallway if they're on the behind the mother's back and they get trapped back there, they can they they can figure this out. They're smart, but they'll walk around the hallway and come out on the other side. They're just behind the pipe. Uh -huh. Is what I'm saying. I think we got a little glitching on the camera. I'm just going to straighten this cable out. Okay. Real quick. Apologize. Don't mean to disrupt you. No, that's great. Just want to make sure people at home can see. Hopefully that will straighten it out a little bit. Yeah. Did that make sense? How we? Oh. How Sorry guys, <laughs> I dropped my camera, I'm trying to fix thing. Um, yeah, so basically, and I apologize for the visuals guys, we'll get those straightened out right away. Um, so the bars are in there are in there to keep the sows from... The sows from sitting on the babies, exactly. So what we did was we put a metal pipe seven inches off the ground and seven inches away from the wall. And we didn't do it in front, but we did it on the left side, the back, and the right side. So what that means is, if um, it means that the babies can get out of the danger zone, uh, and they can't get pushed up against a wall and trapped. Mm -hmm. So if the mother lies her back up against this left side, and, the, and there's a baby pig back there, well, he's actually got this crawl space, this safety zone, where he can walk to the back and then come back out again and then you know, belly up to the bar to nurse. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. And I'll show those again, just because I think I got the camera straightened out, just in case you guys couldn't see them. Again, sorry for the visuals, but we are, you know, live streaming in high definition out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Takes a little bit of tech. And I, some... like to, I like to say it's the middle of everywhere. Middle of everywhere. <laughs> I like that better, too. Okay, so we're going to go see a little bit of what my son Noah was doing kind of applying the next bandage to where the big rainstorm uh, prevented us from achieving our goal of 100% ground cover. Yeah, I mean, the, the Northeast has had quite a bit of uh, rain, right? An enormous amount, crazy amount. Mm -hmm. 
So you can see there's a couple of bare spots. Stuff like this will grow back very, very nicely. Yeah. It, you, you see, it's a, there's a difference between a surface disturbance and a deep disturbance. Yep. And I see you've already spread some hay here, it looks like, and it's already decomposing. And a that, little bit. Yeah. No, so you can see what my son's doing is that spot that was more than a surface disturbance, it's gonna get recovered. And I, I'm, not a, I'm not really in favor of reseeding usually, but in this case, there are seeds in the hay. And that's gonna go back onto the ground. And we cut the hay on our property. So we know that we're not bringing weed seeds of species we don't already have. I was gonna ask you that if, if you're sourcing all the hay from your own pastures, kind yeah. of. You said that you had another pa uh, about 60 acres where you're doing a lot of hay at least once one part of the season? Yep, that's right. Gotcha. <laughs> this is a shade structure that we built here on the farm. You know, we purchased a, an old dairy farm and uh, we had a whole lot of free stalls that we weren't um, using. It's the places where the cows, if I understand correctly, where the cows would uh, lounge when they weren't being milked or eating. And uh, we took those free stalls, we disassembled them, straightened them out, welded them together, and put them on the running gears of an old hay wagon. And you can see how much shade, if you look around, there's a lot of sun, it's pretty hot. I'm sweating here. You imagine you know, a dark colored pig that weighs, you know, 600 pounds just out in the sun. Um, she, she wouldn't like that. So anyway, this particular paddock has a lot of trees, but if I just had the pigs out in a hay field or just a pure pasture, you know, with no shade, um, they would need this. I, I, you know, I guess the take home message is uh, be thrifty, be creative, build some stuff that you don't think your pigs can destroy. And, uh, and make sure your pigs are comfortable because a comfortable pig is a happy pig and a happy pig has a strong immune system and a good you know, fertility and a good you know, rate of gain. And just when the pig's comfortable and happy, you know, then you'll have a better, smoother running operation. Awesome. And, um... What, what, uh, what breeds of pigs are you raising out here? Um, if you guys can see the pigs that I'm showing the camera to, they're pretty dark colored. Uh, they have two breeds in their ancestry. One is called the large black, and the other is Berkshire. And these pigs show a little, they're a cross, so they kind of show a little bit of elements of both. And nice. they show their ability to roll in the mud. <laughs> Pigs and mud, who'd have thought? Yeah. Okay, thanks, John. Shall we go back where there's better signal? We're actually good right here. Oh, okay, great. Um, then, and I'm, may I just interrupt for a moment and just show please. this grass line? Mm -hmm. If you guys can see this grass line, it's pretty, is that, is that showing up pretty good? That's pretty distinct. You know, the grass is three feet tall on one side and it's six inches tall on the other side. Ah. Uh, and you know, a lot of people say pigs don't eat grass, but just look at how much grass they've eaten. They've eaten an ocean of grass, literally tons and tons of grass. And I really want to keep them doing that for lots of reasons, their health and the earth's health. Awesome, and then um, just make sure we're good visually, Kennedy. Still getting a little glitch. Sorry, John. One yeah. second. We can head back to that hill if you'd like, where we had really good signal. We'll talk some more. Um, sure, sure. Yeah. What? Where did you want to cover next after this? Um, so this is the this is the bulk of what there is to see with the pigs. If, okay. If everybody can just see the main idea, it's grassy, it's weedy. There's a diversity of bushes, forages, broadleaves, weedy stuff. There's oak trees, there's pine trees, there's, you know, birch. Um, there's, there's a lot of diversity here. And what I, <clears throat> one thing that I really like to keep in mind, right now they're on three and a half acres. So if we had, uh, let's say that the farm was 200 acres, imagine that the pigs are on three and a half acres right now. That leaves 
197-ish acres where there's not pigs, where wildlife has, you know, free run, you know? So the birds out in that field can be laying eggs, you know, there are little otters in, in the creeks. There's muskrat in the pond. We had a farm manager once who saw a moose. We regularly see deer like run through this little river valley behind us. Exactly. There's wild turkeys. There's just, there's all kinds of species. There's, there's so many species. And the nice thing about regenerative grazing is that it's going to heavily impact Kennedy. one spot for a short amount of time, but the rest of the time, it's free run for the wildlife. And I really like that because wildlife's really special. Absolutely. Let me just check in with the studio, Kennedy. Can you hear me? Okay, just keep me updated, please, on the visuals so I know if I need to move. Okay, we're good here. We're good. Sorry, sorry, John. And I'm sorry okay. to our live audience. I think we're in a good spot now, though, Kennedy. Is that right? Okay. And it's shady here. Yeah. So why don't we just, we'll just hang out here and keep talking if that's okay with you, John. Absolutely. Just so we make sure we keep a live audience. Let's do it. Okay, great. Um, so where were we before I disrupted the flow? Oh, no. So just, I mean, I, when we're thinking about the production element of farming, we're thinking about how do we give more to the land than we're taking. And the way that we do that is, you know, short grazing intervals followed by long recovery periods. It's, it's important to note that if you really want to maximize your regenerative effect, that you're not on a 21-day cycle or a 35-day cycle. It's not like an arbitrary number that you just decide upon in February and then execute you know, throughout the growing season. You can do that. If that's, if that's what you've got bandwidth for, great, do that. But if you really want to maximize your regenerative effect and get more healing faster, then you're not telling the land what you're going to do. The land is telling you what you're going to do. So depending on your stocking density, the impact that you achieve with your grazing event, uh, the size of the animals, the number of the animals, the season, whether it's a drought or you get lots of rain, there's a lot of factors that go into it. And basically what you want is you want to be turning the animals into a field. I'm talking about pigs. I'm not a cow expert. I might not even be a pig expert. I just like hanging out with them. <laughs> so um, I like to turn the pigs into a field as the grass is starting to develop its seed head. Mm -hmm. And if you continuously do that and you achieve the right stocking density so you can get somewhat uniform impact, then you'll have the best regenerative effect you can. And that day length will vary. So in the springtime, um, if, if all other variables being equal, in the springtime, the grass is growing really fast and your rotation is going to be fast because you're trying to keep up with the grass. And usually in August, it gets hot. We have a lot of cool season grasses here. If it gets hot and dry, those grasses slow down. And then my rotation slows down because the earth is telling me to slow down. Gotcha. Um, quick question from our audience, if that's all right. Uh huh. A Tango Paul asked about uh, wildlife and if you have any issues with local area wildlife with your farm. So um, I believe that uh, either wolves and coyotes or large dogs and coyotes have crossed. <laughs> and uh, when I used to live in the Midwest, I like to imagine that a coyote was, you know, on average a 35-pound animal, right? Uh, what we might call a smallish, medium-sized dog. Here, you know, I've got a couple of 90-pound dogs, and the coyotes appear to be larger than them. Um, and uh, so, and they, they sound different here. They don't have the same song that they did, you know, back when I lived in the Midwest. So mm -hmm. I think that they're, the genetics is probably not pure coyote. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're probably, you know, mixed with wolves, Faces. you yeah. know, mixed with wolves or stray dogs or something. But I guess what I'm getting at is they're really, really big here. Yeah. And I don't believe that I have oh, an issue with them. Okay, great. Pigs are pretty 
they fend for themselves fairly well when they get to a certain age, I imagine. Yeah, can you see the big guy down he there? He is massive, he's yes. A, he's 800 pounds. Wow. He's got four inch tusks. Uh -huh. He's a little puppy dog for people. But when big packs of coyotes, I've actually witnessed this with my own eyes. I've seen a pack of coyotes standing outside of the fence and him and his brother, a guy named Golden Boy, just ready to meet them and all the sows standing behind them. Wow. They kind of circle their wagons, you know, so to speak. And all that being said, the coyotes did not attack the pigs. You know, uh, coyotes are intelligent, they're curious, they smell a new smell or they hear something and they want to investigate it. So my personal theory in this ecosystem, even though they're probably mixed with wolves or dogs, um, I'm not losing pigs to them. And um, I don't, I, I've, never, I've never seen any instance of them hurting them at all. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the question, Tango. We'll take a couple more questions, and then I really want to take some time to jump into the business side of farming with you. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got a lot to cover there that'll be really interesting to our audience. Uh, a couple quick questions here. Brian Galea asked, uh, how often do you breed your sows? I breed, Brian, I breed my sows twice a year, and the gestation cycle is just under four months. Yeah, three months, three weeks, three days. Give or, That's what my dad always used to tell me. Great. So two cycles a year. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Brian. Uh, one more question. This one's coming from Toy Andrews. And uh, wherever you guys are watching from, let us know in the chat. We'd love to hear where you guys are watching from, if you're raising pigs yourselves, and a little bit about your farm. Um, Toy Andrews asks, do you ever co-locate the pigs with your sheep? No, we don't, uh, Toy Andrews. We, um, I have read a little bit about that, and pigs are such silly creatures. Um, I've heard um, terrible stories about um, pigs mounting the sheep or trying to breed the, the boars trying to breed the sheep and harming the sheep. Uh, I've heard stories about the you know pigs attempting to eat the lambs <laughs> um so no i i i think it's probably more common to run sheep and cattle together mm -hmm. not that i know much about that but um, i don't put the sheep and the pigs together okay great awesome thank you guys for the questions keep them coming if you have any more uh john if it's all right with you i'd like to turn toward the business side of farming with you and talk a little bit about that does that sound good yeah absolutely um i know you're very passionate about advocating for strong business management practices you talked a little bit earlier with me off camera about you know how you have three sides of farming almost you have um you know marketing you have finance management and then you have the production side and we spend so much time talking about production because it's sort of glamorous it's a lifestyle it's beautiful it's it's it really connects to the human condition but there's another big part of farming right yeah absolutely and you know uh people do like to talk about the farming lifestyle but if we get stuck there uh you're not gonna be a farmer for very long you know it'll be a it'll be a short-lived adventure, you know? So what we really need to talk about is the accounting lifestyle, <laughs> more than the farming lifestyle or the marketing lifestyle. You know, how, um, how can you feel fulfilled in life while managing your money and your accounting? Um, that's probably the most important question because, you know, stringing up fence and operating tractors, taking care of animals, being out in nature, it's very satisfying. But you know what else is satisfying is receiving a paycheck, you know, as a result of your business being successful. So, you know, there's, there's kind of like the three-legged stool that Tyler just mentioned. There's the production. I, I like to think that um, I advise people to watch a couple of 20-minute or 30-minute YouTube videos twice a week. Um, you can pick your hero farmers from a variety of ecosystems, a variety of places, and, uh, and just start a, a notebook or a document or something but every time they throw a pearl of wisdom your way, record it, you know, write that down. I've got my own little section that I just, a little, a little uh, document called Proverbs. Every time that I receive a pearl of wisdom from one of my hero farmers um, or meat processors or marketing people, I, I write it all down. 
you know, it's very important that you're, you're approaching this the same way that you would approach anything that you want. If you are trying to optimize your craft, really approach it like a kid studying for a term paper. You know, be a student of your vocation and be the very best farmer that you can be by, don't just watch the videos and, and receive entertainment and relaxation, but receive those videos in the spirit of transformation. You're going to learn something that's going to help you change a habit or a practice and then tr do that. It doesn't have to be permanent. Do it for 30 days. Give it a trial run. Test drive the car. Test drive the idea. And if you like it, make it part of your life, you know, for a longer term until it no longer serves you. You know, the same thing is true of marketing and accounting because, you know, this is, this is the, the sticky truth is your farming practices for a lot of people aren't going to be the big challenge. You know, a lot of us will learn to be farmers um, quicker than we will learn to be accountants. And to that, you know, my response is that um, if there's any task on my farm that I do not have the, t the talent or the tools to do, I hire it. So did I put the roof on that barn? No. Did I pour the cement on that pad? I did not. Um, did I build my farrowing hutches from scratch? I did not. I hired those tasks out. Just like I hired out my website, just like I hire out my accounting, just like I hire out my marketing, right? So the things that I'm good at are big picture synthesis of a team, uh, the production element, and sales. Everything else, I'm bad at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that's not good enough. So right? what, what advice would you give to a new farmer that is looking to have better financial management of the business? Where should they start? Who should they go talk to? Uh, well, um, oftentimes the Small Business Administration will give you an hour a week, mm -hmm. you know, for a year. Um, I think I have received about 430 mentor classes in the last 12 years. And I really went from having no business or financial uh, experience whatsoever to now after 430 some classes, I have a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So, and to that I would add, you know, like we're approaching this from a farming culture, a farming perspective, you know, which is we, a farming culture, we get up and we take care of our animals. We do our chores. But the important thing in running a business is that chores don't end when your animals are cared for. You know, there's two more steps or maybe three more steps that need to be incorporated into your, into your day. The next, the, after chores are done or before, however you like to do it, but you need to spend about 30 minutes at your desk prioritizing and finding problems with your system. You know, that's in accounting, marketing, production, and anything. You need to find those problems and you need to have a plan for addressing them. Okay, one sec. I think we're overheating a little bit. Noah, do you want to talk at all? Well, uh, anything you want. I don't have anything coming to mind right now. Okay. No, you're doing great. We're good. Okay. Should we come back? Sorry about that. No problem. Um, yeah, uh, so you, you were saying um, that you have more than, more chores after you're done doing your chores. Yeah. If if you're if all you're doing is working with your hands, you're not a business person. You know, you need to do more than just build things and paint things and fix things and string fence and drive tractors and feed animals. You know, that's farming, but that's just that all by itself. That's a short-lived adventure. You know, you need to be taking care of your production stuff. Oftentimes, it makes sense to hire uh, a high school kid to do the labor mm -hmm. so that you can come back. Your responsibility as the leader of a farm is to spend enough time at your desk to know that you're making money or losing money. And when you realize you're losing money, you either have to fix that element or be ruthless and jettison that element. Yeah. You don't have room for an anchor. Uh, it's such, such great advice. Um, Brian Galea says, you know, that's really great advice. Manage for what you want to do and hire out what you don't want to do. And that's just as simple, very simple as that. Amen. Christine Hernandez, uh, 
livestock farmer manager at Heifer Ranch in Perryville. Hey, Christine, she wants to know who are your hero farmers. She's always looking for more to add to her list. You are, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the likely suspects are the usual suspects. You know, um, I really like to watch Gabe Brown videos. Mm -hmm. um, I really like to watch Gabe, uh, not Gabe, uh, Greg Judy uh, videos. He's a cattle and sheep rancher from Missouri. Um, I like um, Alan Williams. I like to read Alan Williams, Ray Archuleta. Um, those are those are the big ones, you know, in, in my life. Um, like we were talking about earlier, Tyler, you know, I've never met a lazy farmer, you know, like that's that's not really a thing, you know, like farmers like to get up and work. But um, being able to divide that between their production, their accounting and their marketing is really important. And there's there's one device, if you want to call it a device that we use on a daily basis that helps us. It's like the compass that we use to help steer our ship. Um, it's a bill of materials document based on various whip levels for our cost of goods sold. So if, that, if, I, if I could distill that down, when on a farm, your whip level one for a pig farm, you know, work in progress level one is creating that baby pig. You know, what is every single detail of expense that goes into creating that baby pig? That's whip level one, right? Work in progress level one on your bill of materials for creating the raw material that we're putting in the snack sticks. Whip level two is what does it take to create, to take that baby piglet from being weaned at let's say 10 weeks of age all the way up to weighing 300 pounds and ready for harvest, right? That's whip level two, right? Whip level three, work in progress level three, is that pig is no longer walking around on hooves, it's in boxes in the freezer on a pallet. That's whip level three. What are all the expenses that went in in between raising it and getting it in boxes. There's a lot of things to note. I mean, transportation, processing, whether you have to pay for the cardboard, the freezer storage. Then for me, the next whip level is tr transporting that raw material to a sausage factory. You know, if it doesn't happen at the same place that harvest takes place, get it to the sausage factory, make the sausage, get it in its packaging, put it in master cases on the next pallet, right? So if you can dissect every individual element of your big picture operation, then you, know, you can optimize each one of those things. And having a bill of materials with various work in progress levels related to your cost of goods sold is far and away the best way for you to create your pricing. Because until you know exactly what your cost of materials is, it's kind of like you're just kind of playing in the dark, you know? Like if you don't know exactly what your, car, what your cost of materials is, you're gonna have a really hard time achieving your target margin. Mm -hmm. And that's the name of the game. Knowing the prices of your inputs, your cost of goods sold, just your entire business, being able to have those numbers accurate, looking at them, uh, and then how do you how do you look at market pricing? Mar so market pricing defined as what do we sell for? Yeah, what's your price point? What do you set your price points at? Who your competitors are? Is it just constant research, or do you got any tricks? Or yeah, you know, so um, you know, what I like to say is that chores isn't over until you've optimized the system for thirty minutes, made a cold call, and documented all of it. Right, so that's part of a farmer's daily chores. That needs to be part of a farmer's daily chores. Not just taking care of the animals. That's not farming, mm -hmm. right? That's taking care of animals. Farming is attempting to generate a paycheck from feeding animals. And then the way that you do that is by optimizing a system, doing a couple of cold calls and documenting the whole thing. So um, if you spend a little bit of time at your desk, it's just great to have you know, a competitor's document. And generally speaking, you know, there's, co there's cooperators and there's competitors. You know, I like to think that 
you know, local farmers aren't really competing with each other so much as they're, you know, the rising tide rises all ships. Uh -huh. You know, um, what we're really competing against is Smithfield. Right. You know, that's our, and, and they'll, they'll be a different story, a different price point. They won't really be a good metric for measuring, but just culturally and philosophically, it, it's good for farmers to realize it's, it's not your neighbors that you're competing with. You know, it's the perception that we in America have the luxury of only spending 3% of our income on food, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's what you're competing with. Gotcha. Great, great advice. Uh, let me check the chat to see if you guys have any more questions. We've got a few more minutes to hang out here at Singing Pastures Farm uh, with John Arbuckle. Thank you so much, everybody, for hanging out and watching uh, with us today. And um, John, thank you, of course, for your time and, and showing us your beautiful farm and sharing your advice. Um, let's see. We did have one question from Cindy Harlow earlier. And Cindy asks, is production related? Uh, what are the genetic makeup of your pigs, purebred or crosses? I think we kind of touched on that, but if you can just re yeah. let Cindy know. Cindy, they're, um, they're all crosses. You know, we, um, we prioritize our breeding program not based on breed, but based on performance. You know, so that's a fancy way of saying the pigs that do really good <laughs> get to stay, and the pigs that don't do really good, they get to go. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, they are uh, mostly a cross between large black and Berkshire. Great. Awesome. Great question, Cindy. And if you guys have any uh, business related questions, uh, financial management or advice, uh, pop them in the chat. I got a couple more for John myself. If I could just add one thing, just Please. about that last question. Absolutely. Cindy. It's everybody don't get too hung up on the breed. You know, um, there's, all, there's a lot of variation within a breed. So there can be good Berkshires and bad Berkshires. There can be Berkshires that, you know, don't make you any money, and there's Berkshires that have great confirmation and great rate of gain. Don't get stuck on the breed. You mm -hmm. know, the breed is, is less important than the performance of the animal. And if you have your own breeding program, um, really, you know, mark with ear tags the ones that you like best for whatever your selection criteria is. Ear tag them with a different color of ear tag. And then you're going to remember, you're like, hot diggity dog, these are the ones I really wanted to keep. And when it comes time to leave, you know, to sell pigs, you'll know, okay, the ones with the orange ear tags, you know, those are my keepers or my potential keepers. You know, the ones with the red ear tags are not. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, so uh, talk, talking a little bit about, you know, about getting your product to market. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you have for new and beginning farmers that are they're in they're getting into raising pigs they've getting their production down they're starting to get some processing going and um, you know when should farmers look for market opportunities and where should they look you know I don't think you should ever stop looking for market opportunities mm -hmm. you know um, like you said cold call someone every day if you cold call somebody every day and then you record it if you cold call somebody every day and you don't record it then you're wasting your time you know um, if you cold call somebody every day, you have a notebook or you have a spreadsheet, you record who you talk to, when you talk to them, what the exchange was, how excited they were, you know, when the, if it's a grocery store, when their, when their new set starts again, just write it all down, you know, and then you, it's time well spent. But call, call everybody, you know, call the restaurants close to you, call the grocery stores close to you. I would start that way first because you know, it's not about getting a yes from a buyer. It's about getting the yes, and then it's about supporting that buyer with good customer service on your part, on the farmer's part. So if that buyer says yes, make sure that you don't bombard them with emails, but if you want to send all your buyers a blind carbon copy, you know, a newsletter twice a month with a couple of pictures of your farm, you know, you just want to keep yourself at the forefront of their mind rather than, oh, yeah, there's the guy who I once bought sausage from and then I never heard from him again. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be that guy, you know. So keep, um, keep your buyers, you know, on a monthly schedule of receiving something from you. And build those relationships. Build like, those relationships. Don't just take build, it for granted. Yeah, build your community. Yeah, well, that's great. Uh, any, any last bits of advice or anything you'd like to share with our, our, our live audience? You know, um, I encourage everybody to make a discipline out of two things. 
You know, one of those things is, well, actually three things. You know, you have to have desk time to be a farmer. Um, that's mandatory. There's no way around it. Uh, the other is you need mentors. It's mandatory. There's no way around that either. You need to have hero farmers. You need to have hero accountants, hero operational people, you know, you, and you need to be mentoring with those people, right? Because you're not, you're not stuck on an island. You're not living in a bubble, you know. You need to be able to synthesize the three things of production, accounting, and marketing. And you won't do it all by yourself. You know, you have to have other people. And uh, lastly, you know, is the discipline of self-care, you know, because in the farming world, you know, there's a lot of um, pride in having a good work ethic and working long hours. That's all very important. But um, I think that farmers need to spend time relaxing in their hammock, going fishing, you know, just doing all sorts of just fun self-care kind of things because um, I recently read in a study that once you've exceeded, you know, something long, 60, 80 hours a week, you know, your, your IQ will drop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's no way, there's really no way around it, you know. And farmers are problem solvers. You know, we have to have, I, I really need every point of IQ that I can muster to find out-of-the-box solutions for the problems that I'm having. And if I'm spending, you know, 14 hours a day, you know, mucking out barns and stringing fence, I don't want to be super tired when I sit down at my desk to have to make big money decisions. Yeah. You know what I mean? So th those are the three things. You, you need to spend time at your desk. You have to have a mentor. There needs to be the discipline of self-care. I think that is uh, excellent, excellent advice. Uh, John mentioned they used to be a savory hub here in Maine uh, at Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas. We are a savory hub. And if you're interested in what John talked about with uh, savory training, holistic management training, we have uh, the savory uh, holistic management intensive workshops that we host at Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas. We got another one coming up this February. We got farmers on the ground right now uh, doing their second day or their second session. I think both sessions are five days, but if you're interested in Savory Institute holistic management training opportunities, sign up to our email list. Um, you can find the link in our bio and we'll notify you when we do those as well. Um, thanks so much for watching. I hope you found this content helpful. Um, we've got a lot of other great content on our channel for you to check out. Lots of these other farm tours at farms all over the country. We're crisscrossing America, taking you live up, up close and personal to some of the best regenerative farms in America that are doing things right and trying to get on the ground with the farmer and see things up close and personal. So check out all those videos, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next time that we go live here on Heifer USA. Thanks again, John. We'll see you guys later next time.